this is the Bryn Kethley V Minecraft experience. You'll note that Jenny did not attempt to pronounce that particular Welsh name. Um, I've heard it mangled a great many ways over the years. Um, and you can see just in front of me there to the right of my PowerPoint slide in inverted commas, which is of course actually a Minecraft blackboard, um, the tomb itself. I'm gonna give you a quick introduction to the site, to my project um, and the medium of this talk will be a, a moving tour around the uh, Minecraft world that I created. So welcome to the Brink the Minecraft experience. Note how slide transitions are going to work in this particular world. I destroy the uh, board that I've just spoken on. Right. I think it probably behoves me to give you some background to what Brinkethy D actually is. It has been described as the Stonehenge of Wales, um, somewhat inappropriately, but it is roughly the same date as the, as the better known Stonehenge. It's actually a passage tomb, one of only three in England and Wales, which simply means it is a burial chamber within a mound accessed by a stone built passageway. And that's, of course, what you can see in front of me on the right there. The tomb itself was constructed, we think, somewhere around 3100 BC. What's quite remarkable about it is that on the summer solstice, the sunrise of the longest day of the year, the tomb passage is aligned directly on that sunrise in the southeast. And if the weather's good, which it isn't always on Anglesey, let's be honest, um, when the sun rises, it shines directly down the passageway into the tomb and illuminates the back of the mound, where in the Neolithic, uh, human remains, of course, would have been interred, although there are no traces of those left anymore. It's a very important site because the tomb itself is actually the final phase in a much longer history. So we have this incredibly rare megalithic passage tomb, but preceding it was a henge monument. A Henge Monument being nothing more, uh, despite the name Stonehenge, etc, etc. All a Henge is, is a Neolithic kind of monument, dates again to around 3200 BC onwards. Um, it's nothing more than a ditch with a bank outside it. Which instantly is quite interesting because, of course, if you had the Usually you dig a ditch and put the bank on the inside because that would be defensible, for example, you know, like a like a fort. But no, with hinges, you have a ditch and the bank is on the outside. Um, and there are a large number of those across across the British Isles and they have some kind of ritual or ceremonial purpose. Uh, here, of course, um, our henge is succeeded by this enormous megalithic passage to. Uh, there's also a stone circle built around the inside of that henge and in the very centre of the of the henge before the tomb is built of course there is this elaborate decorated stone covered in in what we call passage tomb art it's a kind of incised ground down and pecked uh, rock art motif so it's a remarkable site because of it where it's a palimpsest of lots of different monument types now the landscape project itself which is our study of this tomb and its surroundings, has been running since 2015. It's a collaboration between archaeologists at Manchester Metropolitan University, but also CADU, the Welsh Heritage Agency. Uh, we have artists in residence, and we have a uh, partnership with Oriel Innes Mon, which is the local museum and art gallery. We have at no point excavated burial mound itself. And that's because it was excavated in the 1930s and reconstructed. So there's absolutely no point. What we have been doing is a lot of excavation and survey and rock art recording in the landscape around the tomb. Before we started in 2015, it was a lovely reconstructed tomb in the middle of a valley. Very pretty, very nice to visit. It was completely divorced from any kind of prehistoric context, which is why we started the landscape project. Um, and I'll be showing you on this on this sort of tour around the landscape of some of the things that we found, which I've reconstructed in the Minecraft world. You might ask, well, why have I bothered to create the Brink FAD landscape in Minecraft? And it's because a huge part of our project, it was not a research project purely and simply. Uh, equally, and I mean equally, I'm, this is not just saying this, equally important was the uh, outreach, public engagement stuff that we did 
alongside the excavations as well. So this is why we had artists in residence on the site, the huge open day every year on the weekend closest to the solstice. Uh, school visits from six or seven local primary schools. We did a treasure trail around uh, Anglesey. You can get pin badges from the museum if you completed all the clues. We had tie-in museum exhibits at the Museum and Art Gallery. And of course, we had to cancel it all. Um, we had to cancel the excavations for um, 2020. We had to cancel everything because of the coronavirus pandemic. But of course, the educational outreach stuff, the school tours are so important um, that in the Easter holidays, uh, me and my daughter, who um, goes to school in Wales near Wrexham, um, it was the Easter holidays. We thought, well, we can't do any of this outreach stuff. So let's build Brink FDD in Minecraft. And it quickly went from just reconstructing the tomb to reconstructing the whole thing. Um, and we then were able to share this world with all the schools that um, would have come to visit the site uh, and also, uh, well, share the whole world really through the uh, Manchester Centre for Public History and Heritage website. So really this was, an, uh, the aim was to continue in some form the outreach work, outreach work that we're doing, something educational for kids to do during lockdown, you know, and, and certainly the construction of it was that for my primary school age daughter. Anyway, let's get on to the main event. These are the aims and the running order, if you like. So I'm going to outline the content of the Minecraft world to introduce you to Brink FDV and the archaeology that we've found around and about. I'm going to explain the process of creating the world, including some of the technical challenges that had to be overcome, and, and there were a few. And uh, then at the end, hopefully, we'll have a stab at evaluating the success of the project, at least from a public engagement perspective. Right. They are my opening, in inverted commas, slides. I think it probably the best thing to do at the beginning here is actually to show you round Brinkethly D itself. Here we have the reconstructed mound, the passage grave. You can see I've got the remains of my henge ditch around the outside and the remains of my stone circle within it. And then the mound that has been constructed in the center. You will see as we go around some of these uh, little signboards that I've put up, not to dominate the view too much, but at least to give uh, anybody using the world an idea of what's going on. So, you know, when it was excavated, a human ear bone was found inside, which it was indeed. But as you can see here, we have the reconstructed mound. Uh, this, of course, is a <laughs> lamp I had to put in so you could actually read this signboard uh, indicating this very strange tree trunk like post uh, stone pillar that sits in the middle of the mound you will instantly recognize one of the limitations of minecraft here that in the re in real life this stone is almost cylindrical in shape but minecraft uses one by one meter voxels which are these blocks so unfortunately it's a smooth piece of granite but it is of course rectangular in the modern day, you wouldn't see the, uh, the inside of the tomb like this because when it was excavated and then reconstructed in the 1930s, they didn't reconstruct the full size of the mound. So the back is missing. And if you visit in real life, you'll be able to see daylight out the back because they left a little um, sort of rock cut window that you could view the, in so you could actually see daylight and uh, you can see the inside when you, when you come and visit it. So this is Brinkethley D and this is the site that the landscape and the project is named after. But there's much, much more to it than that. I have added for the ease of navigation of the landscape, various teleportation devices. And you'll see why in a minute, it's because uh, walking around or flying around a Minecraft world takes far too long. So this is the first of our teleportation stations. And it's gonna take us to the sort of second part if you like of this talk, which is looking at the way we reconstructed the Brinkhefty landscape as a whole. Note the teleportation. I had great fun learning how to do that. Right, as you can see on our slide here, in order to present the archaeological landscape properly, the first thing you have to do is accurately reproduce the topography. You have to make the valley. Now, the way we did this was not to horribly, lengthily reconstruct the landscape by hand, it would take forever. What we did is we took actual satellite LIDAR data, actual contour data of the valley, from taken by the Environment Agency for flood mapping purposes, which comes happily as a one meter, which is of course the resolution of, of Minecraft, but a one meter resolution grayscale height map of the valley. This gets put into a third party piece of software called World Painter, which can turn bitmaps, grayscale bitmaps, into actual contour models 
in Minecraft. So we've taken the digital terrain model from LiDAR and turned it into a Minecraft world. World Painter also allows you to sort of paint large swathes onto the landscape of things that you'd like. So in, in this case, we added the biomes, which in Minecraft terms is forest, grassland, swamp, jungle, etc. And also, and critically, it allowed me to add the accurate course of the rivers from a sort of top-down map perspective, which saved an enormous amount of time. This is then exported as a Macworld file, um, which is a standard uh, file for uh, that Minecraft uses, which actually is nothing more than a renamed zip archive with the uh, various DAT files and so forth in it. The world punch allows you to export this as a world file, and then um, you, can, you can put it into Minecraft so you can edit the fine details. Now, as I mentioned, there are some technical challenges here. The most immediate problem is that World Painter, the edition that was available, converts to the uh, exports to the Java edition of Minecraft, which is actually not the one most people use now. They use the one that Microsoft brought out when they took over uh, Mojang, which is the Bedrock Edition, which of course is based on a C++ architecture. Um, but that's okay, because there's another third party program called MCC Tool Chest, which can convert Java worlds to Bedrock, as they call it, worlds in the, the latest version. And this is actually quite useful because the Bedrock Edition is the basis of the Education Edition, which I'm using at the moment. It's the basis of the standard now downloadable commercial version. It's the same as the ones you can use on tablets and phones. And it's also the same one that you can use on Xbox. So it's completely cross-platform, which is useful. There was one problem, which is when we converted to the Bedrock Edition, all of the trees had gone which was a pain because then we had to plant every single tree that you're gonna see in this world by hand and cause it to grow instantaneously by treating the sapling with bone meal. Uh, more on that a bit later. Right, so where have I teleported us to to illustrate this point? I've teleported you to this viewing platform, which I have suspended in the sky. And I've done that for a very good reason. You can see down there below us see this glass floor, Brinkethley the itself, the mound, you can also see some other features of the archaeological landscape, which I will be discussing as we move through them. But actually, the reason I brought you up here was to show you the landscape. So these are the contour mo uh, lines turned into a Minecraft world, taken from the digital terrain model from the LiDAR data. And so the contours that you would see largely on an OS map are reproduced on the ground in the world here. As I've mentioned, all the trees have been manually planted, so you can start to see some of the effort involved. But I also want to point out here the course of the rivers running through the landscape. Um, this is the Afon Bryant, the River Bryant, which uh, flows down one side of Brinkethley Dee, and this is another minor watercourse. You do see as well, however, that the swamp biome I painted on the landscape remained, and that was very useful because in the Neolithic, this would indeed have been a very marshy and waterlogged area with the tomb sat upon a sort of gravel island in between these two streams. So I was very pleased to be able to represent that swampiness. Sadly, you can't see the swampiness anymore today because both rivers have been canalized. But I hope you can see from this the value of getting that accurate terrain model directly into Minecraft to form the basis of the world. Right. Our next teleportation station. I'm not gonna lie, I had a huge amount of fun learning how to teleport, such as this one. Bonk. We just teleported in free fall. And it's teleported down once more to the top of Bryn Kethley V. Now, what I wanted to do here was show you how we've integrated some of the archeological results of our work into the landscape. So I'll basically take you on the sort of path I've created for the tour. Immediately behind Brinkethley V are a load of early Bronze Age burial mounds, which are now invisible uh, on the surface. If you visited today, we discovered these two back here by geophysics. This one was attested from aerial photography, as was this very large one here. Now, this was really important finding the project because it, it was it was beginning to bring time depth to the Brinkethley D landscape. It was showing that the incredible Neolithic tomb didn't sit alone in the landscape. It was part of a tradition of ritual behavior. These bronze, early Bronze Age mounds, of course, dating after this Neolithic mound, went out of use. Especially good 
is the fact that over two years we actually excavated this burial cairn. So what I have reconstructed here is accurate based on our excavation. Insofar as one can be accurate with one by one meter stone blocks. But we did indeed discover a stone built mound, no passage into this one, they don't do that in the early Bronze Age, but a stone built mound with inner curb and then an outer curb constructed later. We finished the excavations on this in 2019. Obviously, Minecraft has certain limitations, not just in resolution, but in the way that you can, say, present archaeological discoveries. But I was particularly pleased to find a flower pot model that I could stick in to represent the cremation we discovered in a pot just between the two curbs of this burial cairn. Nice little touch. If we progress further down the path, you can see that we're moving through the uh, burial mound landscape or Cairn Cemetery, as we call it, to just slightly further down this little sand and gravel ridge, almost at the end of it before we hit the marshland, something we excavated in 2017. And these are some Neolithic pits. Now, they don't look much in Minecraft, and let me tell you, they don't look like much in real life either. They are literally a cluster of five pits we found dug into the natural gravel, and these would probably have dated at the same time as Brinkethi the burial mound, maybe even slightly later, but certainly before those early Bronze Age mounds we've just walked past. And within these pits, not all of them, but some of them, we found grooved ware pottery, which is a particular later Neolithic style of pottery, which interestingly enough, is decorated in the same way as the stone rock art you find in burial mounds like Brinkethley D. So it's a lovely link. Now the archaeological landscape did not stop here. Because it's quite a big one, you'll see that I'm making fulsome use of my newly discovered teleporters to show you some of the other archaeological elements of this landscape. So this one I have themed around a door. Yeah. Bonk. Here we have travelled across the valley from Binkethly Dee, which you can now see behind us with my observation station perched in midair. And here I want to talk to you about a real key part of our landscape survey. So it was great finding these burial mounds and, and investigating them and excavating them, but an enormous part of the project was identifying completely unknown rock art. We trebled the known amount on Anglesey by just surveying this one valley. There were six, seven, eight known panels of rock art dating from the late Neolithic and early Bronze Age on Anglesey before we started, one of which was in the Brink FDD landscape, and we found at least eight or nine, um, actually no, 12 more panels of rock art, sorry. Now, the thing about Neolithic rock art is that it's not terribly impressive. It is nothing more than a shallow cup, sometimes some rings around those cups, carved onto faces of rock. And when I say a shallow cup, I mean it. It's about two, three inches across and about an inch deep. And that is it. The only way you can tell it is art is that you find these arranged in interesting patterns, a sort of roseate, or indeed you, you, you find these cups um, encircled by incised uh, rings as well. Then there was just such a panel of rock art on a large rock outcrop uh, immediately to the north of Brinkethy D. See Brinkethy D over there. And here we have reconstructed the rock outcrop. Now, one of the huge challenges of representing really quite boring Neolithic rock art is how do you do that in Minecraft? And the best I could do was these rather disappointing marble blocks. But hopefully you get the idea. Look, in the center, there might just be, with the eye of faith, a small cup. Um, as we can see, Neolithic rock art are cut marks carved into the rock. You can still go and see these uh, cut marks uh, in the modern landscape, uh, that you can't access this outcrop itself as it's on the farmer's land, there's no footpath. You'll also notice in real life this rock outcrop is a great deal smaller than it is in this Minecraft edition, and that's because it was blast quarried in the 19th century, and one shudders to think how much more rock art has been lost with the dramatic reduction in size of this rock outcrop due to that quarrying. How do I know there was quarrying, you ask? Well, I 3D modelled it and showed it, but more importantly than that, we wasted an entire year digging holes around the outside of the outcrop, trying to find more rock art or bits of flint or something like that, and all we found 
were drill holes for the blasting. Uh, there's a sheep here. They did have sheep in the Neolithic. You'll be pleased to know. Now, just to give you a quick walk down this path. Paths, of course, did not necessarily exist where I've put them in the Neolithic, but I wanted to sort of author a way you could explore the landscape without it being prescriptive. And I thought paths showed you the way you could take it if you wanted to as a user of the world, but of course you could explore um, in a self-authored manner, however you wished. The path here leads us to a standing stone. And as you can see, people put up standing stones in the Neolithic and why they did this is a mystery and it genuinely is, there is no way of knowing. Now, this brings us to another potential problem with reproducing uh, the new Stone Age, the Neolithic in Minecraft, in that it's stone and is actually relatively boring. And a standing stone in real life is not a terrible amount more interesting than it is in Minecraft. So it became quite important to add more educational or interpretive elements to the world that might be a bit more engaging, uh, more on engagement in a little while. But here, what I wanted to do was represent deforestation, because of course, if the only raw material you have in prehistory is stone, wood and bone, and that is literally it, um, then some educational representation of this deforestation I felt was quite important. Because of course, an important element of the work is education aimed at primary school children. It's not just about creating a pretty world. So adding interpretative elements, and I call them interpretive because of course there is no direct archeological evidence that we have dug up for deforestation. Now, how could there be? Um, we do have wide, broad scale pollen evidence from the pollen records that so we know that deforestation was occurring. Um, and we also know that they were chopping down birch and oak trees, which happily are things that you can reproduce in Minecraft. But I felt that putting elements like this that could be discovered as one moves through the landscape was an important way of adding interest and also educational elements um, to the experience. I also quite like putting in make-believe chopped down trees. Now, Accessibility, I think this requires a little bit more of our attention. Accessibility, the way I defined it here, is not just ease of use, and of course Minecraft is a good choice for that because it's the most downloaded game in the world in history, uh, and certainly in the world at the moment. Um, but also accessibility should really encompass ongoing engagement by children. Something is inaccessible if it is boring. All right. So just as hopefully I'm not boring you, but I can't see your faces because I'm sharing my screen, is that this couldn't be boring either. It had to be accessible. Now, to use Minecraft, and the reason why I've put teleporters in today for this talk, is that if you were going to explore the whole of the landscape, it would get boring because you can only walk or run or fly at the speed of your character, which raises the problem of travel time between things in the landscape. And we have scaled this in real um, terms, haven't we? We've used the reconstructed landscape for this. So I couldn't go shortening the distances between things. And so if you're gonna do it accurately, to put all the stuff we'd found, all the rock art panels, a couple of other um, standing stones and so on into the landscape, would actually have been quite boring because to experience them you've had to walk long distances within the game. So this necessitates a compromise between reconstructing everything we know and user engagement. So we deliberately left out a huge number of rock art outcrops and uh, two standing stones because well the rock art is uh, in real life about a kilometer in that direction and the standing stones on the top of that hill you can see through the trees there just too far away to be useful. So and that was, of course, another reason to introduce interpretive elements like this deforestation. If you were to continue down this path and over a little bridge, you will see the second rock art outcrop that I put in, which is in its correct place. Uh, but I won't take you there now for the reasons I have just uh, discussed on that board. Instead, I want to talk about discovery of things within the Minecraft world pull our teleporter lever, bonk. And this is another element of user engagement and thus accessibility, is the idea 
of enchantment, uh, as Sarah Perry calls it in 2019, but perhaps more broadly could be called discovery. All right? This brings me back to talking about the way we used paths in the world. Now, you'll remember that I was disappointed that I had to plant all of the trees myself because they hadn't been converted along with the world. Actually, this turned out to be a blessing in disguise because having put the various elements of the world together, we could use the trees and the paths to shape user movement, which meant that you came upon elements of the landscape without being to see them from a long distance because you were following a winding path through the trees. This, if you like, is a Minecraft version of, of what those 18th century garden designers tried to do outside stately homes. You walk around the park and you suddenly encounter beautiful views or follies or objects in the gardens. And so the paths and having to plant the trees manually allowed us to do this, allowed us to screen views, and it allowed us to shape movement. And I say us because at the tree planting stage, um, I got my daughter into the world on another computer so she could help with the tree planting, and we did it together. So here we are back at the mound, but I would just like to take you down this one path that I think rather elegantly demonstrates this um, engagement, this discovery, the emphasis of enchantment within the landscape. So this path was deliberately formulated through quite dense woodland, so you couldn't see where we were going. We put a kink in at the end here, so that as we come round the corner, we suddenly encounter a Neolithic house. Uh, the grass can also be grown to screen views between trees. So this element of discovery and enchantment engagement, I think, was a very important part of making the world accessible to school kids, you know, relatively short attention spans, etc. Now, this house is also an interpretive, well, perhaps more than that, uh, the use of an artistic piece of license within the world. And it's a response, a deliberate response to a question we get a lot on open days when people could actually come and visit us, which is, OK, this is where you've buried the Neolithic people in these tombs, but where did they live? And I'll be honest, around Brinkethley V, we just don't know. There was no house found at Brinkethley V in any of our excavations. But in order to sort of answer this question, to add another interesting element to the world, this element of discovery and so on, I decided to reconstruct a real Neolithic house from Anglesey, but one that was, re was excavated at the north of the island in a place called Llan Vaifli. Um, not just one house, actually, they found a, a cluster of houses, um, really fascinating, um, very, very rare find for, for well, well, for Britain, to be honest, and, and certainly for, for Anglesey and Wales. But we used their excellent uh, ground plans, was, um, excavated by, um, well, actually, somebody who's about to become a PhD student at MMU, um, Kat Rees, um, she excavated this at Llan Vaifli and we were able, she did it so well, we were able to reconstruct the ground plan uh, of the house, including the position of these large timber posts and internal divisions of space. Uh, you can see here we've got some artistic license with a, with a campfire going, um, but the internal divisions were interpreted by the excavator as places to keep your animals within the building because it's a very very large building and if we are to draw on ethnographic and indeed early medieval parallels of long houses people tend to occupy the short end the animals get most of the space down the other end you see i put some pottery in here as well the roof is interpretive um, obviously nothing in british prehistory survives much above ground level uh, but this is the interpreted reconstruction of other Neolithic longhouses from other parts of Europe. Um, so it's a pretty fair bet that it would have looked something like this. The final feature, uh, which my daughter fenced in so the horses wouldn't eat it, and indeed planted as well, is a crop of wheat, which is actually quite important because people had domesticated wheat and were growing it in the Neolithic. We have evidence along as we do for their raising uh, cattle, sheep and pigs uh, in the pollen record for cereal cultivation. Now, final element I want to take you to, if we go through this magical teleporting tree, is part six, how we published and distributed the world. For accessibility purposes, we produced three versions of the Minecraft experience. A Welsh language version in the education edition, 
because of course it was primarily Welsh language schools that we had visiting the site. It is a Welsh site. We had a lot of Welsh language speaking volunteers who came excavating with us as well. And the bilingual element was incredibly important to us and also to our schools partners, museum partners and CADU as well. We also created an English language edition in, in uh, language version in the edu education edition. And finally, I created an English language version in the commercial bedrock edition, which could be downloaded and used by anybody who had a version of Minecraft that wasn't the educational version, basically. The education version you see is distributed free to schools. Um, so I knew that every school in Wales potentially had access for free to the education edition of Minecraft. For example, my daughter's school had the facility to share their logging details, the sort of school um, learning resources hub with the kids. So at home, my daughter is able to download the education edition of Minecraft for free via her school. I was able to do it through the university. It's the version we're using at the moment. But of course, many people might not have access to the education edition or perhaps have the commercial bedrock edition instead. So we had to produce a version for that. And there are there are slight differences between the two versions, but they are largely interoperable. You do need to do a bit of file editing, which I shan't bore you with, where you basically lie to the commercial version and say it wasn't created. Um, uh, sorry, you lie to the education edition and tell it it wasn't created in the commercial version, which allows you to open it in the education version. Also, because schools have access to the education edition of Minecraft, we were able to share it and distribute it through the Welsh Government's online learning resources uh, hub called Hub Cymru. Um, but also, of course, for schools who are based in Wales or for people who didn't have the education edition, I also shared all three versions through the uh, Manchester Centre for Public History and Heritage website, which, of course, is the, uh, the sort of research centre that MMU that I am affiliated with. You can see at the bottom of this slide here as well, there are technical issues, as I've mentioned, of converting one version to the other, which required me to go back to the uh, my MCC tool chest PE program to edit the DAT files. Basically, you delete the line that says this was last opened in whatever version, be it the education, be it the uh, commercial version or whatever, uh, and then you can open it in the education edition. Interestingly enough, you cannot convert education worlds back to commercial editions. I don't know why, haven't been able to edit that files to allow that, it just doesn't work. So what we did is we created the world in the commercial version and then ported it to the education edition afterwards. I'm using the education edition today because it has these excellent blackboards, which I couldn't find in the commercial version. Oops, excuse me, let's get rid of that one. And you can see a view from this little tree house I've created as the final, uh, concluding location of the world. Rather proud of it, you can't see it from ground level. I was that good at building it. So that's me. Uh, hopefully you found this interesting and stimulating and um, have managed to take on board some of my rambling commentary about the world, the archeology span and the technical issues about bringing um, the reconstructed archeological landscape to life in Minecraft. Um, thanks very much for listening.